So now um, I have a question uh, to Daniel Metzler. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Um, because Rocket Factory Augsburg, it's, it's the first time that we uh, have a company that didn't show up um, and we normally do the meetings um, in our office. Um, Daniel, I prepared seven slides and I just want to ask you if we can do uh, uh, five, six questions to you so you don't have to pre prepare anything. Um, but it would be really, really nice if you if you could do it. You just caught me in the right minute, actually. I just finished my meeting uh, 25 seconds ago. <laughs> Awesome. That's uh, maybe a coincidence, maybe not. Um, so uh, yeah, what I want to do because um, uh, you um, right now have a lot of things to do, right? You are moving into another facility. I've just read. Yes, we're actually not just moving into another facility, but an additional facility uh, where we will host our complete orbital launch vehicle production and assembly. So first, okay. flight hardware maybe. will be assembled there. Exactly. Maybe I just wanted to jump in there because I don't know if everyone knows who ESA Aerospace is. I think we are already jumping one step ahead. So maybe, uh, Daniel, if you could just give a, a short introduction what ESA Aerospace yes. does. Sure. That's a good, that's a good thing. Um, I, I just want to um, uh, say something um, before we, we start with you, Daniel Metzler. Now we are two Daniels. That's a bit confusing. Um, but it was also very interesting when we met for the first time um, in, a, in a room uh, with uh, the uh, Amazon Web Service CEO, Andy Jesse, in, in Berlin. And it was uh, really uh, impressive. It was a, a small round table with uh, 25 selected startups. And there were two space startups, one from Earth Observation uh, Industry and uh, Dani Metzer from ESA Aerospace. And uh, it was really, really nice uh, to see you there. And it also shows that uh, you're building a really great product. Um, and yeah, now I would give you the stage to introduce your um, uh, your company and you. Sure. Just uh, I, I'd like to keep it uh, short. Um, is Aerospace is ensuring access to space from Europe. Um, so we're building Europe's most powerful orbital launch vehicle that is privately developed and privately financed. Um, so we're not dependent on any public funding so far. Um, fully privately uh, funded. Also, up until now, we have under uh, we undergo a quite steep trajectory. I'd say um, we were founded just two years ago, um, early 2018. Um, grew now to roughly 50 employees. Um, we're expanding massively, even despite um, Corona situations. Um, and in the end, what we want to do is uh, to make space access also for small satellites, but especially also satellite constellations, uh, low cost and more flexible without the hassle that also Yuri previously explained that I uh, got to just see with one eye uh, during my, my other meeting I just had. Um, but in the end, yeah, space as we know it uh, as of today is a lot of bureaucracy. And we just want to strip all of that away to make space access for everyone just easier. It's uh, re really great uh, what, what you're doing. And I also um, uh, have heard from you that you, you grow out of the um, VAR group in, in Munich, right? Exactly. So uh, ESA Aerospace was founded as a spin-off from the Technical University of Munich uh, from VAR, which is a student rocketry group which actually was founded by Professor Schmucker, who still did his PhD thesis on the Saturn V upper stage rocket engine G2. Um, and this is actually also why we are driven by all of the launch topics in itself. Um, so even the PhD supervisor from Professor Schmucker was a uh, core team of Werner von Braun to build the Saturn V. Um, he was called Professor Harvey Ruppe as well, a professor from the Technical University of Munich. And this is actually what many people just don't know. Um, there's a lot of history in Germany, in and around Munich, especially in the launch sector. Um, professor Ruppe was actually the guy to define that Saturn V will have five engines in the first stage and not four. Um, today, we'd say we're quite lucky because otherwise, most likely, we would not have made it to orbit. <laughs> So uh, that's um, that's really interesting because it's also a coincidence. Um, uh, can you see my my screen right now? 
We can see all the flickering on my side. Yeah, oh. yeah, it's oh, flickering. Yeah, give me a second uh, because that is also my uh, my my first slide. I think now it's gone. Now right? it's Perfect. not flickering anymore. Oh, no, it's back. Great, yeah. Um, so I didn't know that, um, and uh, that, that's um, like you have a somehow now the connection to the Z5, um, because uh, also as a as a starting point, um, uh, I want to now share around 10 slides with you, and I will ask you one question for each slide, um, maybe where you position is the aerospace. Um, and so here you can see actually the um, uh, the three stages of uh, the Z5. And what was really interesting, um, so in, in live view, we are doing a weekly knowledge sharing session, and I reused the slides of this. And during uh, the preparation, I found that uh, the stage rocket concept was actually developed uh, by Johann Schmidt Lab um, in uh, 1608. And um, yeah, so can you share a bit about uh, your, your rocket? Um, so how, how many stages uh, do you going to have, and uh, what is your approach? Sure. Um, so the Spectrum rocket will have two stages. Um, not one, because with a single stage to orbit, you would just have to massively increase performance on the propulsion side as well as on the structural side. So these are the main two topics um, why you need stages even uh, just to get to orbit. Uh, whereas we don't want to do three, four or more stages um, due to a lower risk profile. So every staging you do on the rocket imposes another potential failure case, uh, whereas the, I'd say, classical two-stage vehicle design has proven to be the best out of both worlds from performance as well as reliability. Uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, so the next slide is uh, also something which Sven and I and our pitches always show. And my question to you is, because we have a revolution of Earth observation and you see the, the satellite launch, uh, which are launching there, uh, how often did you use this slide in your funding round? Not not the slide, but this graph about the rocket launches. And uh, how, how did it help you in the, um, in the funding of your um, yeah, great Series A round? Uh, very good, although I guess you don't want to hear the number of investors we also talked to before coming up with the actual Series A funding round. Um, so still today, uh, funding on space companies is super hard, mostly because also investors on the technological side just don't have the basic knowledge on to understand and evaluate the technology. Um, whereas we have also seen companies that would just pitch non-physical performance, um, which is just really physically not possible. Um, so for an investor, it's always hard to also see. Um, how is the actual physics behind? Um, most of the investors, unfortunately, um, don't have a master's or a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, or whatever. Um, but yeah, in, in general, um, this is what we see a lot, um, not just the number of launches, but also the number of satellites uh, launched to space, as well as the numbers of satellites to be launched. So there's a lot of different satellite constellations to be launched. Uh, which is also what we design our rocket for. We're not going for 150 or 200 kilogram payload capacity because we want to target the satellite constellation market towards the next five years and not the CubeSat market from the past five years. What uh, we've uh, done for the past five years, we're always increasing a bit on the on the masses also of the very, very small satellite. That's great. Uh, we are we are pretty good soon today because that would also be my next question on the next slide. And I, I swear that Daniel Metzler didn't see the slides before, so uh, this must we be can. The name then. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here you can see different um, uh, satellites which we of uh, live view, of course, uh, um, which we use. Um, and you just said um, so. Um, yeah, maybe you can show it on the slide what uh, fits into um, your uh, spectrum rocket. Um, in that case, actually. Everything up to Pleiades, including Pleiades. Um, so the launcher we're building is not too small anymore um, because we want to target a market where there's also a super strong business case behind, um, many of which are just needing on the physical side, again, um, a minimum amount or a minimum diameter um, telescope, for example, cameras, um, sensors that just need high um, high power supplies, which again just is driving the the satellite size. Uh, but we see right now a lot of satellites in the range of I'd say 
40 to 200, 250 kilograms each, uh, mostly the ones that uh, build up constellations, um, where you again have uh, topics such as onboard propulsion systems, inter-satellite links, that all push again the size from the very, very small um, planet labs sized CubeSat up towards the Parabella sky uh, sized satellites. Parabella actually is a, quite a quite a good um, good example um, because there we also see on a timeline um, Parabella was re replacing uh, former satellites uh, that were about 11 years before Parabella launched into space that had 10 times the mass of the Parabella sky set. Um, so over the course of about 10 years, you see a mass decrease of about 90%. Um, which is just showing how the technology on the satellites uh, develop over time. Yeah, and that, that also shows how connected uh, the entire industry is um, and uh, what, like on every aspect of, of the um, value chain on, in space, it, it's changing, right? For us, uh, we can process uh, terabytes of data um, uh, of Earth observation satellites. We're actually using uh, all of them, which are shown here. Um, and uh, now also the rockets um, are um, uh, really uh, dis disrupting the industry. So my next um, uh, slide is actually um, an overview uh, for, from Blue Origin of different uh, um, uh, rockets. Um, where, so how um, is your rocket uh, regarding the size compared to the rockets on, on this uh, slide? Uh, we're about half the size of a Soyuz. Um, so still compared to, I'd say in that case, the bigger rockets, um, we're still an order of magnitude smaller. Um, but for us, again, the drivers are the customer for the size of the rocket. Um, and what most satellite constellations, for example, look like is you have five, six, seven satellites per orbital plane, every satellite at, let's say, 100 kilogram each. Um, so you would deploy all of the satellites within one orbital plane on one single launch um, in order to also increase performance on the vehicle um, such that you don't have to do uh, in-orbit inclination changes and um, then you in the end uh, come out at roughly uh, 500 to 700 kilograms for many of the satellite constellations that are currently under planning. Um, so, for example, if you also compare it to a Falcon 9 on the payload side, we're about by a factor of 20 smaller with one ton of payload capacity to low Earth orbit, whereas the Falcon 9 is somewhere between 15 to 20 tons. Interesting. Uh, um, my next uh, uh, question to you is also somehow connected. Here we can see uh, the payload assembly of a, of a Skyset, for example. So what you just said is also that you may not uh, carry so many satellites, but you can go into dedicated orbits uh, with them. Um, and uh, my question uh, regarding this is, uh, where do you going to launch? Do you may going to launch in a, um, a space uh, port in Germany in the future? Um, we're right now in contact with about half a dozen spaceports globally. Um, to be honest, we don't follow the German spaceport idea just because from a geographical point of view, from an orbital mechanics point of view, it does not make too much sense. Um, we do have something nice that is called European Union, um, which we can also leverage in the space industry. Um, so for us, we're right now not pursuing a German spaceport at all. Most likely, we would also not be using it because just physically um, and geographically, it does not make sense because you have to fly trajectories that are super, super low performing, um, whereas you can very well go towards uh, made be Scotland, uh, French Guiana, Sweden, Norway. There's a lot of, uh, of of launch pads that are better suited for orbital launches than a German spaceport would. That's uh, really interesting because we've uh, heard this uh, very often, uh, this discussion also at, at past New Space Breakfast. Uh, thanks for your opinion on that one. Um, and uh, you said something in the beginning about the failure. So this is uh, the average uh, failure reason for rocket launches. Um, what is the disruptive thing about uh, your rocket and uh, do you have um, something, um, so uh, where are you improving um, the failures, uh, the probability on engines? Um, we started off actually uh, of building ESA Aerospace initially as an engine only company uh, because at the time, early 2018, we actually already saw 
uh, there's a lot of micro launchers on the market, um, but only few of them actually knew how to build rocket engines. Um, so initially, we, we just wanted to build rocket engines commercially off the shelf for these companies until we realized that most of the small launcher companies globally don't have any clue, not just about the engine part of the rocket, but also on an overall level. Um, so we then actually afterwards decided uh, if there's going to be a successful orbital launcher within Europe, uh, it's only going to happen if we build the entire vehicle ourselves. And then uh, went out also for, uh, for fundraising, um, not just to build rocket engines, but the entire vehicle. Um, the engine still is the one system on board that is most critical. It's also the most complex to develop on the rocket. Um, it's also the one where our team is by far the biggest within the company and where we put the most effort in. Um, engine is a lot about testing. So you want to get from simulation to actual hardware building and testing as soon as possible. Um, in that case, we are, again, not just uh, trying to make the, the system itself as reliable as possible, um, but also to... Uh, to make the processes uh, during production, for example, as fault proof as possible, which also means a lot of automation. Um, so for example, uh, there's uh, um, 3D printed combustion chambers, there's 3D printed turbo pump components, where in the end you can very well rely um, and afterwards also check um, all of the quality assurance that you can mostly do automatically um, in the end, really, it's all about testing. Uh, we're using actually also quite eco-friendly light hydrocarbon combined with liquid oxygen as propellants in order to make sure that also our emissions are about between 20 to 40 percent less than uh, during commercial uh, standard launches as have been. So, for example, on a solid rocket as Vega. Um, on the other hand, also, we're pushing the performance um, because especially on the small launch vehicles, you see a high sensitivity of engine performance on overall payload capacity. That means, for example, if your engine is just dropping about 1% to 2% in actual uh, performance um, in, in numbers or parameters, that would be mostly the specific impulse of the rocket engine, your payload drastically decreases um, so, for example, a three to four percent uh, decrease in performance uh, you can very well see in about a ten to fifteen percent decrease in payload capacity, which on the small launchers very well has an impact on uh, on the entire business case. Yeah, great, yeah. great, uh, great, and uh, really interesting answer. Um, so, the next uh, question uh, from my side to you would be: um, So, here are some engines. Uh, just a, a, a short answer, one sentence. Uh, where do you position uh, yourself? So, what um, are, can you the compare? rocket engine is a 75 kilonewton rocket engine. Um, compared to Vinci, it's um, it's about a quarter of the size uh, compared to Astos as well, uh, because these are upper stage rocket engines. Um, so, thrust wise, we're between the uh, Astos and Vinci engine. Nice. Super cool. Um, and now uh, we, we can see um, like two typical um, uh, launch uh, treasure, the launch procedures, the one from Ariane. And what I really like from SpaceX is this, uh, um, this uh, diagram, which shows uh, how they are uh, landing um, back on Earth. Um, are there any plans to build a reusable um, uh, rocket? I will, I, I will definitely not say no. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So we do have the advantage that the guy who was responsible at SpaceX for building the reusability on Falcon 9 was one of our uh, first investors, Bülent Altan, who spent 12 years at, as a VP at SpaceX, built the entire avionics, including also all of the trajectory designs um, and reusability requirements. Um, so for us, obviously, it is somewhere already within the company, also on a know-how level. Um, for the first launches, we will definitely not go for reusability just due to fast time to market. Um, but we already did some calculations. Uh, we do have some ideas, but it will still take a few years, I guess, before uh, any easy aerospace rocket will get reusable. I mean, a few years sounds great. Um, um, I mean, typically it, it takes uh, longer. 
um, if you ask the Ariane guys. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, spontaneous uh, question round um, uh, with you to get uh, also a bit um, and knowledge about what uh, ESA Aerospace is doing. Um, You're would welcome. Love to see you would love to see you also in the discussion with uh, Mark um, in around 10 minutes because